In all adversity of fortune, the most wretched kind is to have once found happiness. Imagine that you were going to die in the near future. And not just die, but die extraordinarily painfully. Ooh. All for the crime of sticking by your principles and being a just person who fought evil and corruption in your state. This was the fate awaiting the philosopher Boethius at the beginning of the 6th century. He was imprisoned on charges of treason merely for defending the Roman Senate, and as a result was brutally executed. While I love humans. We brutally execute people. Ooh. That's crazy. While he was in prison, certain of his macabre fate, he wrote down all the thoughts and ideas that gave him comfort in his final days. This is the consolation of philosophy, and it contains some of the most insightful writings on how to endure an unlivable situation that I have ever read. Every page is packed with reasoned arguments and heavy pathos. If you are going through some severe suffering, then Boethius has something to offer you, and I hope you'll explore him with me today. Get ready to learn the value in some of our deepest philosophical problems, what kind of ideas make life worth living, and much, much more. As always, bear in mind that this is just my flawed and incomplete interpretation of Boethius' words, and I do encourage you to read him for yourself, as this will be infinitely more valuable than anything I can tell you. But with that caveat, let's get started. 1. The Problem of Pointless Suffering In theology, the problem of evil is the idea that an all-knowing, all-powerful and all-loving God would not allow for any evil to exist in the world, since he would know about it, be able to stop it, and be more than willing to stop it. Since evil exists, some people argue that a god with these three properties cannot exist. However, arguably, this is a variant of a much deeper and more emotional problem, which is simply the existence of suffering itself. In one of the oldest works of literature we have, the Epic of Gilgamesh, our protagonist is driven to existential despair by the death of a loved one and the fear of his own impending demise. Here, he is not worried about the promises of an all-loving and all-powerful god. The problem lies not in contradictory properties, but the bare, harsh reality of pain itself, and especially pain that seems pointless or unjustifiable. Boethius is confronting this problem in droves. He is writing the consolation in prison, awaiting torture and his eventual fate, being beaten to death. And his distress is not just caused by the fact this terrible sentence awaits him, but also because it all seems so unjust. He spoke up in defense of the Senate and Rome for all he saw as right and good, and now he is condemned to die for it. He insinuates that the main reason his political enemies have orchestrated this downfall was because of Boethius's impeccable character and incorruptibility in his office. Boethius served as a minister, and he brought people to ruin for misusing their positions, and this made him a threat to to anyone who planned on doing so in the future. In a world of factions, he chose to be principled, and for that, he must suffer and be snuffed out. The sheer bewildering unfairness of it all eats away at Boethius' heart. He is a virtuous man, helpless in the face of amoral superior powers. He wants to cry out, it's not fair, and he is right, it isn't, the whole situation is supremely unjust. So what comfort could he possibly take from it? I think the way Boethius frames this problem as one of unfair suffering really cuts to the heart of why this book can resonate with us today. While we are hopefully not awaiting a painful execution, most of us are perpetually being beaten beaten down by the everyday injustices and pains of life on this planet. We've tried to make a relationship work for years, only to later discover that our partner is just not ready to settle down. We have stood up to corruption in our workplace or organization, only to be fired for our troubles. We have defended someone unfairly maligned in the name of truth. But rather than stop the machine of condemnation, we were instead caught in its grasp. Boethius touches upon something we all know to be true, but is also one of the most agonizing parts of the human condition. Sometimes you can be honest, integrous, and principled, and still end up losing. Sometimes you suffer completely unjustifiably. This same problem is reflected in the small child denied dessert for misbehavior they did not commit. Two martyrs tortured to death for defending their values in the face of an authoritarian government. It is what Plato saw as one of the deepest ethical problems in philosophy. What use is the good since it is constantly trampled underfoot by the evil? I tend to refer to this broadly as the problem of pointless suffering, and it arguably hits at the core of existential issues in philosophy. After all, if we only ever felt pleasant sensations, then there'd be no need for anything beyond enough food and water to sustain our bliss-filled lives. We would reside in a biblical-style Garden of Eden, desiring nothing and simply enjoying existence itself. This is still the state that some monks profess to fall into after years of study and meditation. However, since existence is flawed, we experience suffering. 
This would not be so bad if we only ever suffered in service to something we found meaningful. If whenever we experienced pain it brought about greater pleasure later down the line, or was for some grand value we held. But for most people, meaningful pain seems to be the exception rather than the rule. When I get injured or lose a loved one or fall ill, this is not some grand edifying experience in and of itself, but it instead seems remarkably hollow. Pain can seem indiscriminate mm. and ridiculous and- That used to be my background for the longest time. I love, I love that. I love it. I love it. Um, we always talk about suffering wisely. Like you want to suffer wisely. You want to move, you know, I'll put Rashad in our conversation I'll post it after stream today, but I was trying to explain to him like moving away from evil and towards joy. And it's about suffering wisely. And I don't think people on mass suffer wisely. Like we don't know how to one, cause we're riddled with fear. And two, because we want some sort of like retribution or revenge or results, you know, and look, the louder people get usually the calmer I end up being in some aspect but that's because i'm witnessing it like right in front of me like this lack of suffering wisely you know um and i think that's fascinating but also i know that i haven't always suffered wisely i've suffered unwisely most of my life which is why i know there's a distinct difference between the two because i have the lived tangible embodied experience of the difference you know defy justification. It comes across as the uncaring face of the universe laughing at us, letting us know that all our effort and striving will come to naught. It is one of the most visceral times we lock eyes with what Albert Camus called. And that's also why, and maybe this is because I'm internally motivated, if the world kills you, that's the world's business. It's not justified, but it's not my business. You know, it's it, I know this This is a in a philosophy sense, of course, not a literal sense, right? But like the world's killing me, like I told Rashad, the, if the nuke comes and lands on my head, that is not my business. I didn't do that, right? Like somebody did it and I was the fallout of the consequence. Like of their actions is my death, you know? And so if the mob takes you and kills you because you're gay, that has nothing to do with you. That is a reflection of them. And this is why I say the mob is evil because usually when humans move as a mob, they move away from their joy and they become like this angry thing. So when I see a mob going after somebody, I know they're moving towards evil and I can feel it in the way they want that person to suffer. Even the desire of wanting someone to suffer is suffering unwisely. You are torturing yourself with desires of revenge, holding on to the bitterness and making yourself more evil because you feel like it's justified. And if you remember Socrates and all these great philosophers, they were killed. There's a reason even Jesus as a philosopher is interesting because he was killed for preaching peace. Now, of course, also he said he was the king of the Jews. So, you know, kind of a problem. But in general, it's interesting what people will justify, you know, in others. And joy leads you furthest from evil, right? Yeah, said Tom Fuller said his joy landed him in jail. After thinking about it, I was like, I don't think joy brings destruction to the self or others. Tom was confusing temporary happiness and joy with philosophy joy. So you know how like, again, I don't know if people understand that philosophy is its own subject with its own language. And when, when this man is talking, I don't know his name yet. What's his name? When he is talking about suffering, he's not talking about the kind of version of suffering people are thinking about. When we're talking about joy, we're not talking about eating an ice cream. Though we could use it as an example of like reveling in the profoundness of just being able to eat an ice cream. We're not talking about temporary happiness. We're talking about longevity. Uh, when, when Marcus Aurelius says you must be one with your nature, he's not saying the part of your nature that's destructive and addictive. He's saying the part of your nature that lands you towards joy. He even says the word joy. So when philosophers are talking, we're not talking about temporary happiness we're talking about longevity one with the spirit and i know it sounds woo woo but again okay so we're talking about one with the sense of like symbiosis working together right so if the world comes at you and kills you i think and you know i've read plato i've read socrates i think the funny thing about you know plato being socrates a student is this is this might not be true but this is what i recall this might not be true they said <laughs> From my memory, and I haven't read it since I was, what, 20? So it's been like 15 years. Plato is the one who wrote down and documented Socrates' life. Socrates never wrote a word of his life, based. 
And allegedly before he died, the last thing he said or along the lines of what he said was, we owe our neighbor a chicken. The idea being that even in death, Socrates had a sense of humor about him because it was almost like predictable what happened to him. It is predictable that people will feel it justified to abuse you because you've pissed them off. It's the way I feel about Amanda Seals, where just being who she is makes people feel like she deserves to be fired, ostracized, and bullied because she's annoying to them. They simply do not like her. She's not doing anything immoral. She's not cheating, sleeping with someone's wife, hurting someone's kid. She's not lying. She's not moving funds. She's not stealing from the company. She is literally just being her personality. And that is enough for people to wish so much ill on this woman. And that is the fear of the mob. The mob does not know how to suffer wisely. And so they will make you suffer. And the world will continue to make each other suffer because none of us know how to suffer wisely. I have no enemies. And there's something that I, you know, you have to learn, like, that's so significant for me to say I have no enemies. When I felt my whole life, like I was fighting the world. That is so significant for a person that always feels like she's battling the world to realize, like, I ain't got no enemies. And my greatest, like, adversary is myself. I'm not in competition with any other YouTubers. I'm in competition with myself. Chess says Socrates was ADHD. Trust me, bro. Stop. Fired. <laughs> Honestly, I feel like autism might have been playing a role, you know? <laughs> the absurd. The gulf between the meaning we want to see in reality and the universe's silence in response to our plea. We are in agony. And for what? Precisely nothing. This in turn might be okay if all we ever faced was a stubbed toe. Normally we can get over such trivial pains pretty quickly. But I would wager that almost every single person watching this video has experienced profound pain that moreover seemed unfair or arbitrary. Nietzsche thought this was one reason why people needed a sense of meaning in their lives. Because without it, we have no reason to bear all of this unpleasantness and we would quickly fall into despair. This is partly what he means by his famous phrase, the man with a strong enough why can bear any how. Conversely, some of by his famous phrase, the man with a strong enough why can bear any how. Ooh, the man with the, with the strong enough why can bear any how. Mm, 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 mm. Yo, if you made that into a mixed drink, I would fucking boop. Conversely, someone with no why will find all but the most pleasant how utterly unbearable, since they'd be weighed down by the sheer pointlessness of their difficulties. And Boethius is in desperate need of a why. But on his way there, he first takes the time to outline all of the ways someone can find meaning that is too fragile to hold water in difficult situations. And his analysis can tell us a lot about how to answer existential questions in our own lives. If you want to support the channel and help me make more videos like this, then please consider subscribing to my email list, my channel, or my Patreon. The links are in the description. Two, the false idols. To touch upon Nietzsche again, in his brilliant book, Twilight of the Idols, he examines a whole series of things people worship as cornerstones of their philosophy. These include various aspects of our ethical systems, the prospect of system building itself, and even the supposed impersonal pursuit of truth. He taps these idols with a hammer to see if they ring hollow, and finding that they do encourages us to dispense with them forthwith. In a way, much of Boethius's book is doing the same thing. He examines many of the goals and pursuits that we think will bring us meaning, and he dismisses them all with pointed criticisms. In each case, he finds that the idol is not fit for purpose, that it will not actually grant someone the strength to bear truly hard times, and in some cases, it will only increase our unhappiness. The first idol on the chopping block is monetary wealth. In some ways, Boethius is criticizing himself here, because in his position as minister to the emperor, he had some serious cash on his hands for quite a long time. But under the cold light of reason, he starts to see this material prosperity very differently. On the one hand, he notices that it does not actually grant us the power to bear much hardship, since very often wealth itself is at risk in difficult times. And if this is the cornerstone of your sense of meaning, you will be well and truly stuffed. Then not only will we have no material comforts, but we will lose our very reason to be. Just as we cannot rely on a friend that supports us one moment but is gone the next, Boethius says it is unwise to place wealth as the great meaning provider of our lives. Mm. Although it is undeniable, Everyone says that. Every gay philosopher, every gay religious leader literally says money is not the end all be all. Yet people are still suffering under this illusion that money will save everything. Money helps a lot when you're poor. It doesn't help much when you're rich. And I think that's the important caveat is like 
once you have it, that isn't going to be the only thing you need. It's this idea of like, if I just had enough money, all my problems would be solved. If I just had a husband, all my problems would be solved. If a woman just said hi to me, my problems would be solved. If only, if only, if only, if only, if only. I think that's like the one tool I wish I could give everybody, which is like, it's not just one thing, guys. Oh, if you just came to Jesus Christ, if you just gave your heart to Allah, if you just did this, if only. Even when religious, you know it's not the end all be all. You can't just give your life to Jesus. You have to pray. You can't just give your life to Allah. You have to go to mosque. You can't just, you have to be. It's never, ever just one thing. Viable that access to bare necessities like food and water are essential if you, you know, want to continue being alive. Boethius thinks that if we center our existence on accruing ever higher piles of gold, then we will waste our lives chasing a phantom. Firstly, he says that if we actually achieve our goals, it will paradoxically add to our stresses. The minute we indulge in luxuries and get our dream house is the minute we become obsessed with maintaining it. And as soon as we value wealth not as a means to other things, but as an end in itself, our needs will climb ever higher, ensuring misery in the long term. It's interesting because, again, from a philosophy perspective, there's the pragmatic perspective, like the practical, like you're living in a world, you've got a function. And then there's the philosophy perspective. So Megan says having money is not everything, not having it is in a practical sense. But then you go to Diogenes, who, of course, is kind of known as this, like, I would say philosopher of poverty, but not poverty because it's kind of like uh, St. Francis, like saying, I will give it all away because I never needed it, right? I will let go of my wealth. I want nothing more than to be content. So there's that story of Diogenes that he's, you know, he's only got this bowl and he lives his life outside and he's doing his thing. And he sees a child cup water with his hands and goes, what a fool I am for carrying around this bowl, you know? And again, there's like that story and who knows, you know, how many of these things are facts when we can't even keep track of our own drama on the internet when it's even documented, okay? But allegedly Diogenes is on the grass enjoying the sun and Alexander the Great comes to him and says like, what can I give you, Diogenes? I'll give you anything. What do you want? And he says, can you move? You're blocking my son. The idea is that the want of something is the practice of attachment. And that idea of I need it, this has to, I need this thing. Need is a very interesting word. I think knowing the why of what you think you need is key. Knowing what you need is very different than thinking what you want is what you need. You know, so I think Diogenes is meant to, he's meant to kind of display this idea of like, what does it even mean to need something, right? And I think that's what I take from him. When I read Alexander the Great, it's more like, how do you have balance with power and the responsibility of leadership and also the understanding that you're still a weak man? You're still nothing. Your memory won't matter. Your legacy won't matter. You will all be forgotten. To fear death is to fear your own nature. That's what Marcus Aurelius would say, right? To fear your own death is to fear your own nature. And if you're going to fear your nature, you will never be one with your nature because you're in denial that you are a man. You are in denial of your own nature. So you got to move towards your joy and furthest from evil by being one with your nature. After all, you could always be richer. Again, this is a particularly potent criticism for Boethius, as he all but admits to having been quite attached to his prior wealth. The same goes for the fleeting emotion of hedonistic pleasure. Famously, the philosopher John Stuart Mill argued that happiness was the supreme good of humankind, because it is what we are all secretly aiming for. But Boethius disagrees. He draws a distinction between a stable philosophical kind of happiness and a moment-to-moment -moment kind of happiness, and says that the latter is always temporary and that without hardship we are never forced to build up the resilience of our characters so that we can bear the brunt of life when it comes. And it will inevitably come. No one is such a successful hedonist that suffering will never come for them. Pain knocks on everything. And even Marcus Aurelius talks about hedonism. Like, be weary of the person that avoids suffering for they are avoiding their nature. They are not being one with their joy, right? Again, when Marcus Aurelius says like one with your nature, he's talking about one with your joy. So when people are hedonistic, they are in denial of reality, which is why I don't like hedonism, right? Like it's not my favorite, but you do you. I think it's a cope. 
I think any label of philosophy is kind of a cope. I think pedestooling any philosopher is a cope. I think thinking any of this matters is a cope. I think like all of it is a cope. And I'm saying like go of your attachment of the cope so you can actually like live your life, you know? There's something to that. And this is philosophy. So this is more than the practical. The practical is separate because it's easy to learn how to like food, water, shelter. Okay, that's like one game. But philosophy is knowing the self, the consciousness, right? The consciousness. So when we're talking about not having material goods and not being rich, we're not saying be homeless. We're saying your attachment to money and your fear of never having it again is a part of your misalignment with nature, right? Um... Uh, Mike says, what do you think of the fable of the scorpion and the tortoise? I mean, I think it represents sort of that idea that we all are born to live out a sense of like a destiny or a, a sense of like fate. And we are our nature. And that there are moments of deviation from the expectation, but it always ends up being the expectation, right? It always ends up being, the scorpion always ends up being a scorpion and a tortoise always ends up being a tortoise. We always end up being what we are. We are man, like we are human. We cannot be anything other than a human. And everything we then do is within our nature, but not in sync with our nature, which is in sync with our joy, you know? Everyone's door at the end. And according to Boethius, making this pain bearable is one of the chief tasks of a personal philosophy. Then, paradoxically, Boethius manages to extract some gratitude from his current misery because he knows that this is his last chance to build his philosophy to its strongest possible position. Or, as he artfully put it, the most happy men are oversensitive. And he thinks this is because, by their very lack of suffering, they have not been granted the opportunity to sharpen their resolve and philosophy. This is one of the key ways through which Boethius finds his consolation during his imprisonment. He is turning his pain into a service to what he values most, philosophy itself. This is not some trite argument that pain is not that bad, actually. Instead, it is the very fact it is so deeply unpleasant that makes it useful for Boethius. He is extracting what he sees as the positives from a horrific fate without denying that the fate is indeed horrific. And thus, he seems to be drawing blood from a stone. So, flying in the face of many of our post-enlightenment ideals, Boethius views the pursuit of happiness again as an empty idol. And so, he commits it to the fire. And this makes perfect sense if what Boethius is looking for is strength specifically in times of suffering. The answer to pain cannot simply be be happy or else no one would ever suffer. This is just denying the problem, it's not solving it. Mm. The very thing Boethius needs is the ability to make his unhappiness meaningful and happiness itself cannot be of help here. So working through each of the idols, Boethius I think it's why people turn to religion or thoughts of giving the pain to the universe. It's like when I can't handle pain, give it to Christ. I don't know if you ever heard that growing up religious, but like if you have too much pain, give it to God, he'll take it from you. And the idea is very nice, but it is sort of a, a placebo effect in a way. It's like a form of meditation almost where you're almost like, I won't, I won't say disassociating, that's the wrong word, but you're giving it to a myth, like a mythical creature in order to place it somewhere else. It's actually like a really good tool. It's actually, strangely, one of the best tools I've seen come out of religion, which is when you are feeling overwhelmed and burdened, give it to God. Give it to God. You know, it's about putting it somewhere else and that derives a meaning, which gives you a purpose and it allows you to like recontextualize the suffering. Lots of people believe in Catholicism that you can suffer for the sake of people in purgatory. So people go to purgatory, they have to suffer X amount of years or time for the sins they did on earth, but at least after purification, they'll get to heaven. And they say that if you pray for the people in purgatory, you can make their sentence lighter. So, you know, if you pray or if you sacrifice, if you're fasting for a day, you can offer up your pain in the name of somebody who's dead in hopes that it will be, quote, used in relation to their quote, purgatory sentence. And so it kind of makes the suffering have a great deep meaning. Or if you're a patriot and you're a prisoner of war, you can like justify your suffering as like, I'm doing it for my country. I'm doing it. I'm one of the guys. I'm doing the thing. Sure, for sure. Whatever you need to get through something. Oh, I thought about my kids. I thought about my wife. You're externalizing it to help you. Now there's the internalization of the suffering which I think I'm much more likely to like have a relationship with myself, where if I was being tortured, I would think about the relationship I was having with me. I don't think I would think I have to survive to get home to my husband because I don't, I don't think that's how my brain works. 
I would be thinking more like the like what is the experience my consciousness and my body are having? I'd be examining it more and being like because I know it I know it's gonna ha- like it could happen. I think that's what's interesting is that we think of torture and I don't want to be tortured, but like we think of torture as something that is kind of rare, but I'm not sure that it is rare so much as that it's contextualized. And so uh, lots of people experience some variation of medium to light to extreme torture. And I think a lot of people have stories about it. We're just defining those words differently and how you survive it is interesting, right? You know, Hannah says the external why is a cope. Oh, wait, what do you guys? Oh, wait, I don't think that's to me. I think you guys are having a conversation about why. Sorry, I didn't mean to derail. Is that to me? Because I don't mean to imply that if it is. We all have different ways. And copes are not bad unless you don't stop coping. Cope is good. It's a Band-Aid solution. I just want to say this out loud. To a problem, coping is fine, just not as a long-term solution. You know? Theus discounts them one by one because of how temporary and fleeting they are, until eventually he discovers the root cause behind almost any unreliable value, fortune itself. That is, anything that relies on factors outside of our direct control. According to Boethius, if someone wants to make fortune the source of their strength or meaning, then it will probably abandon them just when they need it the most. If fortune was rather kindly blowing in our direction, then that is just when a stable idea of meaning is a luxury. But when fortune flies away, it becomes a necessity. So putting any fortune-based good on a pedestal is the very definition of setting ourselves up for failure. We ensure that our meaning will crumble to dust at the very moment it is most vital. This is one upside Boethius sees in his sorry state. Fortune has revealed herself to him as a fickle mistress, and so he knows both not to trust her himself, but can also pass down that wisdom to us. And in his criticisms of these false values, Boethius discovers something that is almost as vital now as it was in his prison cell. 3. The Constraints of Value This is going to sound like a strange question, but what makes an effective or ineffective meaning of life? What is the kind of thing that allows us to bear the slings and arrows of existence's unpredictable ills without falling apart? Boethius has already identified what doesn't work, and many people would probably agree with him. If pressed, most people recognize that endless riches will not make us happy in the long run, even if we sometimes forget that on a day-to-day basis. Likewise, a lot of people view the pursuit of fame or mere hedonic pleasure as shallow and some way. It is tempting to see this as simple snobbery, but I suspect it is because people intuit that these things will not be effective supports. In- I've been thinking about intuitive knowing and why seeking out your joy is sort of intuitive knowing. There's sort of a strong sense of intuition. And we talked about this on the panel with the girls this last month about like how well adjusted your intuition is and then how much of it is informed by wrong information. But I do think there's like an intuitive knowing for, but I think it sets levels and it's bubble based. So I think your intuition is data run. Like I think your intuition is based off data that you've internalized over years that gets recontextualized and reformatted through intuition. That's my theory, right? So every bubble has an intuition of what is like good or bad for you. So funny enough, growing up in a Catholic bubble, my parents would say, doesn't it just like make your stomach sick to think of gay people together. They have three gay kids. Spoiler alert for new people. And I was like, yeah, no. Intuitively as a child, I realized like this cannot be real. Like this cannot be it. It doesn't make sense. But in their bubble, it feels that way. In the same way as a child, I knew not to come out as gay. And then I got that confirmation from the data around me. And again, intuition isn't mythical. It's I think it's data learning, in my opinion. So I do think as a Catholic, that would be a good intuition to have towards your joy is to stay away from homosexuality. But outside of that bubble, it wouldn't make any sense for that to be your intuition because I don't think it would move you in that direction. But then the question is, why do certain things move people in different directions? And is there an objective sense of joy? It's not really the actions you're doing. It's the feeling of being one with your nature. And one with your nature is subjective. There's no clear thing I could tell you to do. Like there's no like, oh, do this to be one with your nature. I can't tell you what to do. I would say you would intuit and you would know it, which is pretty abstract for people. And I know you want people to tell you what to do, but I'm not gonna do that. 
And I would say, you know when something is wrong, when it's ailing you, when you're ashamed of it, when you can't face it, when it plagues you, you're not one with your joy. So like, what is this thing that's troubling you? Why can't you sleep? Why are you having nightmares about it? And sometimes it's a matter of like letting go of the attachment or recontextualizing something, having a conversation with somebody. It is kind of interesting. Like, why, why don't you feel one with your nature? And it's because you're moving towards evil, you know? And so it's about that idea of how do I recontextualize this thing, you know? Discord said, before getting into philosophy in any capacity, I came to the realization that the more I need, the harder life would be. Philosophy and introspection has helped me find a balance with that mindset. Agree. I think so too. Same. In times of trouble, just like Boethius says. But then that raises the question. What will be? Boethius, sitting in prison, awaiting his painful demise, has some thoughts. We have already seen some of his criteria for meaning. They must not rely on simple fortune. But his logic for rejecting fortune was more basic than that. Our pillars of meaning must be stable and able to remain fixed even when our life is in tatters around us. That is, it must be something that remains with us even when all of our circumstances have changed. Thus, Boethius deduces that we should ideally build meaning on ideas rather than anything material. On reflection, this makes a lot of sense. Famously, it's very difficult to kill an idea, and you can take it with you in pretty much every situation. This seems to be one reason Boethius thinks so highly of philosophy. It produces the kind of stable ideas that we can rely on even when shit hits the fan. This is also why Boethius turns specifically to reason to be his guide. Yeah, like what good is your money if you're being tortured by people who don't want it? Philosophy gets you through torture. Even religion will get you through torture way better than your money will. If nobody wants your money, girl, what then? During his imprisonment. Reason and by the way, religion is a form of philosophy, realistically. It's a love for wisdom in its own way, right? I mean, I grew up in a really religious home and my parents love philosophy. My mom's read more books than I've read, a lot of them about philosophy, so is what stabilizes a justified and valuable idea. If you posit something without any argument or evidence, then you're likely to forget it or be persuaded away from it pretty quickly. But if our position is grounded in reason, then it becomes solid enough that we can rely on it to be with us as time marches forward. Hence why Zeno, the founder of Stoicism, said that while assent was like a loose grip, knowledge was like a closed and secured fist. And there are a number of beliefs and arguments that Boethius uses during his attempts to find firm philosophical foundations for his torment. The first of these is that the cause of a lot of excess suffering is desire, and that that desire in turn is sparked from an inability to make sense of one's situation. Following thinkers like Epictetus, Boethius regards the impulses of the body as robbing him of his freedom. He expands upon the... Yeah, Hannah, you said, so your strongest why will be an idea, not something external. That was what I was getting at earlier when I asked if the external is why is a cope. Right. Oh, I get it now. OK, yes, girl. Yeah. Ultimately, philosophy, the love of wisdom, like this idea of knowing, understanding, being one with your nature. All of this is a concept of understanding with the consciousness. It's not externally motivated. It's not like if I have money, this will be a thing. If I have a love, this will be the thing. It's the understanding of self, the purpose, the understanding of like, what does it even mean to exist, right? So it's one of those things where, again, I think people ponder and ask themselves why, and they never run out of why, because how could you run out of why in a universe with infinite amount of information? Like we know so little. And it's funny that instead of spending time knowing more about ourselves, we spend less time knowing. It's why when people talk to me, they're like, I can't, I don't know what you're talking about. Like you're rambling. I don't know what you're saying. It's because you've never engaged in this conversation in a way that like you have to understand. And again, I'm not saying it's better or worse, though I do think people who engage in philosophy in a real and authentic way have a higher probability of finding joy at a statistically higher rate than people who don't, obviously. I think it's like one of the greatest tools. I do think if your ego isn't checked at the door, you're going to like you're going to think like you're better than other people because like I read philosophy like no, the whole point of philosophy is that you're not better than anyone else. If Marcus Aurelius is telling you to get off your fucking high horse and he's done way more than you've ever done in your life, what the fuck are you doing? If the Buddha is telling you get the fuck off your high horse, what are you doing? If Jesus Christ himself is like get the fuck off your high horse, what are you doing? Then why would you think you're better than all these people? You know, it just makes no sense. Like, why would you think you're better? You're not better. You are man. You are the same as all. No one is better. Everybody is the same.
The only reason you would feel better than other people is if you're judging them through what? The lens of your ego, the lens of your values. For sure, bro, do that. On the micro level, I feel you. But on the macro level, in terms of understanding that you are like a living consciousness in the universe, like where does your ego play a role in that? You know? So, you know, keep that in mind. Osha, thank you so much for joining memberships. Let's go, guys. If you join memberships level two, check out the behind the scenes videos. Catch up on them because I've got tons of cooking videos and tons of things. And you guys, uh, that's all accessible. Enjoy. Enjoy. The critique we've just looked at by saying if you desire riches, you may debase yourself to get them. And if most people simply followed their desires, they would become totally disorganized since we often desire conflicting and contradictory things. This is a recipe for misery. In essence, Boethius is arguing that unhappiness is found in the discrepancy between how we desire the world to be and how the world actually is. This is a classic philosophical analysis and it is found every... Classic philosophy philosophical uh, like this is listen existing in existence the way we want the world to be versus the way it is radically accept humans are going to human this is life this is it baby this is life this is humans these are human this let go of your attachment of wanting the world to be different than it is accept it for what it is and then make the best out of your life because you don't need the world to do that. The world will try to cock block you. The world will try to get in your way. Find a way around them. Make a bubble. Find your way around it. They're just afraid. They're so afraid they might just kill you. And that is the reflection of who they are in history, girl. That's why you got to clean up your side of the street and people got to do what they got to do. And you will come into contact with people that might try to destroy you. It is what it is. That is their decision. I do not work to destroy other people. Okay? I will stand up for myself. But I'm not trying to destroy you, girl. I'm just trying to say, you know? But there are people that will specifically target you and go for you. That's their journey. It has nothing to do with you. Let go of the idea that, like, you can control their journey. If you're the villain in their story, it is what it is. If you're the hero in their story, it is what it is. Don't put people on a pedestal, especially yourself. And don't make people a villain, especially yourself. Shout out to Ingrid who said, I'm going to make some beef jerky soon. Guys, I showed you guys how I make beef jerky at home. We're about to make another uh, batch of beef jerky ourselves. I'm pretty, I'm pretty excited. Everywhere from early Buddhist thinkers to the idea of unrequited love. And it's worth noting that Boethius is not arguing this while dwelling in the lap of luxury, but locked in a prison cell awaiting torture and death. So unlike with a lot of thinkers, we cannot charge him with hypocrisy here. The rest of his consolation essentially turns on this realization that in order to lessen his desire for things to be otherwise, he must come up with a way of making sense of his situation. Furthermore, he does not want this to stem through fooling himself as that would be unstable for all the reasons we've just discussed. He wants to find meaning out of logical inquiry. And he does not think that this is going to be an easy task. In fact, he complains that the senselessness of his situation is truly unbearable. Would not his reason compel him to recognize it as such? But he concludes that, despite all appearances, his suffering is meaningful. And he does this in a series of very interesting ways. First, there is a psychological component to his approach. He questions what he would have had to have done in order to alter his fate. Reflecting on this, he realizes that it was abiding by his sense of right and wrong that led him here. It was his very refusal to let wrongs be committed in his eyeline without intervening that means he will now die. But what would be the alternative to this approach? Would he rather have betrayed himself? He considers the situation of the person who would throw in every moral they had for simple expediency and asks if they are truly happy. He concludes that they face an even more miserable existence than him. The implicit suggestion here is that Boethius could either have chosen to be tormented by others or to be tormented by his own mind. But if he betrayed himself, he wouldn't even have the comfort of his own goodness and integrity. He would view the sting of his conscience as even more painful than the executioner's cudgel. Furthermore, according to Boethius, the issue of how he would want the world to be is sort of idle anyway, since he endorses a loose form of rationality to the universe's movements that he considers to be far more important than himself. Consistent with many philosophers of his time, Boethius believes in a sort of divine order to events. Mm -hmm. The root of this... You know what was so interesting finishing up meditations is Marcus Aurelius kept saying, give 
praise to the gods, like give pay homage to the gods. He believed in the gods. Like that's what's so interesting is there's always an element to philosophers. And I think Jordan Peterson suffers from this as well, where it's like, what is God? Who is God? I think it's really difficult to engage in philosophy and not in, in a certain type of philosophy, obviously there's like others like Rand and stuff, but like a certain type of philosophy, which I think is probably closer to truth and furthest from truth, but whatever that means, that does sort of have an element of the metaphysics. I think metaphysics is so important to philosophy and it's probably why I do come across as like a crystal girl, even though I'm not a crystal girl at all, but I understand. It's like why Jordan Peterson comes across as a Christian, even though he's never declared to be one. Because again, when we say even Marcus Aurelius, like give homage to the gods, like pay homage to the gods, the gods, the gods, like people believe these great men who are also very complicated and own slaves, love that. They That's sarcasm, people. They also believed in deities. They believed in gods, higher powers, things bigger than themselves. And again, what is philosophy? Like what is that love for knowledge, that love for knowing, that love for wisdom, that understanding that's like deep and it's like, it's like, it, I imagine sometimes like knowing the why or understanding my consciousness is like me just chipping away at like layers of dirt and underneath it, it's going to have more of an answer. But with every stroke, I learn something about myself. You know, there's something really beautifully profound about knowing yourself in, in, in the least way narcissistic, like in the most way humble where you, like there's something so just there is no better relationship than the relationship you will have with yourself in the most philosophy sense, like in the most philosophy way, right? And again, think about it like being tortured in a cell by yourself. Who's better company than your consciousness, you know? Okay. This belief is different in different thinkers, but essentially whether they believed in an agential god or not, they saw that the universe was predictable based on certain rules. Rules we would now recognize as laws of mathematics or physics or logic. Then, to simplify, some thought that if reason meant anything, then it had to include these fundamental laws of the universe. And furthermore, many argued that what we would call logic or human rationality was justified based on its accordance with these naturalistic principles. This belief manifests in various forms, and it's found all over the place in ancient philosophy, from the Stoics to portions of Aristotle to early Christian thinkers, all of whom influenced Boethius greatly. So Boethius draws on this idea and says that if the universe is supremely rational... This reminds me of Verveke, because this is Verveke's icon, right? Shout out Verveke, meaning crisis. Check it out. ...then there must be a reason he is suffering his fate, even if he does not know what it is. Again, we must bear in mind that this is not just a trite remark about everything happening for a reason, but it follows from Boethius's considered conception of how the universe works. He is not denying that the situation he is in is truly terrible, mm -hmm. and that a grave injustice has been performed in sentencing him to... This is so important. This is so important. When I talk, sometimes people are like, oh, so I guess you don't mind if somebody hurts you or kills you. And I'm like, whoa, that is not the same thing. He knows he's being tortured. He is not without knowledge. Of course he's being tortured and it's unjust and it's horrible. I am not without knowledge that life is unfair and that this is unjust. Philosophy is a separate relationship with the self. This is the practical. Everyone is always arguing the practical because you, you are in survival mode. In survival mode, obviously, we know we're being tortured in the cell. We get it. But when you're in living mode, when you're one with the consciousness, when you're in symbiosis, when you're having a relationship with your nature, when you're doing all of these things, this is different. This is why I have a level system of one through five, because twos get stuck on the surviving, though some twos have a variation of knowing how to live. I've met them. Okay. But twos are in the cycle of surviving. Threes are tired of the surviving, but don't know if they're ready to live. Fours go to living. And fives are living in a philosophy sense, in an introspection sense. Of course, the levels can be mimicked in terms of like Maslow's hierarchy of needs within the two bubble, right? Like you can argue that a two can go through the same cycle, but it's, I'm talking about philosophy in terms of introspection, extrospection, right? There is a level to this knowledge. The way a five suffers is not the way a two suffers, yet an enlightened two can suffer similar to maybe how a five could suffer. But yet if five can end up becoming traumatized or reenacting their trauma because of their genetics and DNA, and they can end up suffering like a two because they lost their strive with introspection. 
because introspection is an active, like you have to have an act, you have to be active. It's a tool that has to be activated and used. Okay. It's like, imagine your introspection is a hammer and you're trying to nail, put a nail in the wall. Okay. If you're a five and you don't have your hammer, then you're trying to be introspective by hitting, using your fist to put the nail on the wall. Now you're fucked like a two who never had the hammer in the first place, except the two doesn't even know there's a hammer. So imagine the two is trying to put the nail on the wall and doesn't even know there's hammers. That's what it's like being a two when it comes to introspection, extrospection. Hey, at least I have a nail in the wall and I could figure it out, but they're going to choose the hardest method possible. It's not going to be reasonable, but it's going to be like good enough. A five is going to be like, oh, I have a hammer. But a five who forgets they have a hammer is basically just a two again. You have to use the introspection. You have to remember you have a hammer. If you forget you have the hammer or you're so traumatized you can't recall you have a hammer, then what good was the introspection, my friends? To die. But Boethius is drawing on some of the best philosophical and scientific theories of his time as a way of making sense and understanding his pain. He is not rejecting his suffering, but making it meaningful by taking comfort in the progression of universal reason. I don't want to evaluate this philosophical framework here. There are obvious criticisms you can make of it from a modern perspective, and if I go into them, then we'll be here all day. I just want to point out how this allows Boethius to come to terms with his desire for things to be otherwise, mm -hmm. by sublimating them to something he sees as far more important. Mm -hmm. His philosophy allows him to tolerate what could have been a totally unbearable situation. His fate may be terrible or horrifying in a way that is difficult for us to even imagine, mm. but he does not see it as pointless. Of course. Oof, love that. Um, Kelsey says, when you do calls, do you chat about things like how to go from level three, four, and five? So <clears throat> my level system, yes, I talk about anything you guys want to talk about, really. It's like support the content, get a call, you know. Um, but the idea behind the calls, and I've owned, the calls are only available on Patreon right now. And right now I'm booked. So if there's a spot open, great. I only have one spot available publicly. All the rest are hidden. So if that spot is taken, mm. but okay. The idea is I might not be the tool to get you to level five, if that's your goal. So remember, even though I am explaining to you the levels, I didn't create the concept of the levels. I'm just recontextualizing philosophy and my relationship with it in a way that makes sense to my brain. But obviously you can go to any philosopher, you can read any book, you can you know research the Buddha, you can meditate, you can do so many, you're gonna have to do all those tools anyways. But don't book a call with me and think Brittany's gonna get me to level five. I'm not gonna do shit you're going to get yourself to whatever level you're supposed to be in, which is in harmony with your nature. That's not up to me. But if you want to pay for a call, okay, support the content, get a call, and we can discuss and have philosophy conversations, cool. But I can't get you to five. That's not how it works. I can't make you into a five. That's not my, that's, I'm, mm, that's you, girl. You, you are the only one who gets to decide where your journey goes. If I can help you, great. But, I might not be the tool for you. Remember that I'm just a tool and it might not be me, you know, but I can't make you a five. You know what I mean? Of course, it's difficult for us to use Boethius's exact framework because we don't tend to view the universe in quite the same way. But I want to analyze some of the insights Boethius turns to for comfort and consolation and what it can tell us about our own existential challenges. Four, what makes a meaning? As I said at the beginning of the video, one of the reasons Boethius is still read and studied and enjoyed today is that he addresses an extreme form of a problem that we all encounter, the issue of how to deal with our own suffering. And even if we disagree with his particular answers, there is much we can learn from Boethius about the process he underwent in finding comfort in his torture. And these are fantastically relevant, whether we are processing a breakup, have fallen on hard times, or are just bewildered by the endless pockets of suffering that seem to stretch before us, running from now to the grave. The first last- Wait, wait, I'll say something out loud, okay? Because this is where my brain goes when I hear that. We are suffering- when we talk about the loneliness problem, when we talk about not feeling loved, when we talk about, oh my God, I just go home and watch Netflix all day. I feel like I'm suffering. You are suffering and your suffering is so valid. Your suffering could be emotionally equal to his physical suffering. And the point is, is that your suffering is your suffering. And me invalidating it and saying like, you know, God forbid you ever suffer for real could be true, but also it is still suffering. 
And now the question is, is it self-inflicted? Everything we do is self-inflicted and everything that happens to us is inflicted by others. These are two different kinds of suffering. And the question is, what do you have control over? The stuff that happens that you do to yourself, right? So you have to work on that to balance out the extrospective, things outside yourself, right? So I think it is just as important to acknowledge the suffering of, how do you say his name? Prometheus? Bometheus, as it is to acknowledge the suffering of the adolescent who never leaves home and watches Netflix until they, you know, rot in their own bed. It is still a form of suffering because it moves you closer to evil and furthest from joy. A person truly in their joy isn't going to be rotting in bed for the rest of their life, right? And it's not physically just rotting in bed. It's also the metaphysical or the mythical, no, the, the, the analogy or metaphor of literally what would be the equivalent of rotting in bed, right? So again, we, we want to move closest to joy and furthest from evil. It's not about being perfect. It's not saying like, oh my God, I can't believe I was closest to my evil. Like for me, it would be like overeating. I am moving closer to evil if I overeat than closer to joy. That doesn't mean once a year I don't binge and eat like a buffet worthy of food, girl. Okay, I'm chilling. But if I did that every day, if I did that every weekend, I would be moving closer to evil and furthest from my joy. Oh my God, Rachel said my 600 pound life. I have never seen so much suffering in my whole life than on that show. My 600 pound life is suffering in a in a package it is just I can't watch it it's so there's just so much suffering when I watch my 600 pound life it feels like I'm watching the souls in hell screaming for one drop of water it is so devastating it's just so devastating to watch that you know it's just oh my gosh and that is suffering and now the irony is like, you can look like you're not suffering, like your life is perfect and be suffering even worse than that. Because again, it's not about comparing suffering. It's about knowing that suffering is an internal complex with the self. You know? Maiden says, God is a participatory symbol that affords self-transcendence. I wouldn't call it a shortcut, more like using human, imaginal, machinery to evolve our evolvability evolvability of course anything adaptive can be maladaptive including beliefs that's in reaction i think to conrad who's having a great conversation about god conrad says i'm just wondering if god allows people to be okay with suffering more because it's basically a philosoph philosophical shortcut i feel like religion is philosophy it's just a bubbled philosophy this is the trouble with philosophy as well is it sends the illusion of of knowing and of objective, and that's not quite true because we don't know it's still through our perception. So whether you're doing philosophy through religion or philosophy through the philosophers, there's still religion. These philosophers believe in gods. Religion isn't, the religion is philosophy. It's just a bubbled philosophy as is identifying as a nihilist or identifying as an objectivist or identifying as a stoic. To say you are a stoic is to say you are religious. To say you are Muslim is to say you are a stoic. It's the same. You're identifying with a philosophy and trapping yourself in the bubble or comforting yourself within the bubble and limiting yourself to this is how I see the world. So this must be what's true. And I say, do what you're going to do. I prefer not to label myself in this capacity because I think all of them hold truth. I think Islam holds truth and Catholicism holds truth and everything holds truth. And I cannot identify with one bubble because it will limit my opportunity to seek out truth. But for some people, I call them twos usually, they usually stick to the bubble and stick to the identity because it gives them enough truth to be satisfied with their life. I felt suffocated when I, I feel suffocated when I limit myself with the truth, which is why I'm still open to God. I'm open to magic. I'm open to whatever is true. Is true. Ingrid says not all religions are like that. I don't think you can be a religion. It not be a bubble. So that's all I'm saying. It doesn't matter if all religions aren't like X. Even the concept of a religion is to say a bubble. Everything is a bubble. Everything is perception. So it doesn't matter if it's like that or not like that, right? Lesson I want to highlight comes from the initial stages of the book where the spirit of philosophy counsels Boethius to look inside himself for strength rather than place his meaning in the hands of external circumstance. Mm. This makes a lot of sense for the reasons we've already examined. Boethius... 
No, cognitive, you said, Prometheus said evil doesn't exist. Suffering is an evil. I'm not saying it's evil in the same sense you're saying it's evil. I'm saying it's not evil to be a human or to suffer. I'm saying evil in a philosophy sense. Nothing we do is evil. It's all humans. Humans are going to human. Is it evil for the bear to eat you? No, it is within the bear's nature. Nothing humans do is evil. And yet we can use evil as the mythos word that it is. Okay. Almost like it's metaphysical furthest from joy, right? We're using words to convey a concept, a metaphorical meaning, right? There, humans cannot be any more evil than a bear is evil. But on the micro, we use these words to mean different things in a practical sense. This is an evil person. Put them in jail. On the macro sense, we mean evil metaphorically furthest from joy. But realistically, of course, if the bear isn't evil for being a bear, how would the human be evil for being a human? Prometheus can always rely on himself to be there, whereas anything else is inherently unstable or temporary. This does not mean that there is nothing about the world that is worth changing. It just advises us to take our source of meaning from within rather than without. The second is that it is not enough to simply wish the pain away with pleasant words. At one point, Boethius says to the spirit of philosophy that her words are comforting in the moment, but he finds her insights very difficult to sustain over time. And this is perfectly understandable and probably familiar to many of us. While Boethius is convinced of his reasons to be in short bursts, he has not yet undergone the arduous process of internalizing these reasons, learning to lean on them for his comforts rather than in empty hopes or wishful dreams. The third is that parallel to the much celebrated pursuit of happiness, we need something that allows us to bear suffering without collapsing. Boethius is not the only person to point this out, but the fact he is staring torture and death in the face adds a certain urgency and plausibility to his analysis. This means that in our existential experiments and approaches to life, we have a vital criterion. How well does this hold up, not just when I am feeling good, but when I am feeling well and truly dreadful? Anyone can wax lyrical about the beauty of life when they are happily married, have a stable career and two charming chubby-cheeked cherubs. But would their meaning hold together if they were to lose everything mm. and end up on the mm. bottom of the pile? Mm. I think many of us certainly are guilty of focusing purely on the pursuit of pleasure rather than the ability to bear the times where the pleasure runs out. Exactly. Joy is not temporary and it is not material. It is not external. It is internal internal you know rachel says Brittany, when did you tell your parents you did not adhere to their religion anymore uh in my religious bubble my parents let us decide at 18 if we would go to church or not so i stopped going to church at 18 and i told them at 15 before confirmation that i was doubting things and i stayed pretty consistent um till i was 18 i stopped going to church and then at 19 i completely stopped believing in god and i had no relationship with god at that point but, um, you know, pretty big deal. My parents are pretty religious. My family's, uh, half of them are religious, half of them aren't. And uh, most of my extended family and cousins are pretty actively religious. Um, religion is a big deal for Assyrians. I mean, Catholicism plays a huge role, you know, in our, in our background. So, um, yeah, that was it, though. I stopped going to church the moment they allowed me to stay home. And the pain starts to come. If I were to reflect on my own life, I think my reasons for being could stand some stress. But if I were to truly lose everything, I'm not sure they would survive. And that shows I have more work to do. It also highlights the extreme difficulty of existentialism. It is by definition really bloody hard to find something that will help you bear unimaginable pain. But this does not make the issue any less important. In fact, it shows that if life is going all right at the moment, then this is the perfect opportunity to prepare ourselves for the hard times that inevitably lie ahead. To repurpose a thought from Machiavelli, temporary peace mm. is not merely for relaxing, but for bolstering our defenses. In this case, our defenses against torment. Lastly, I want to focus on the fact Boethius turns to a metaphysical picture of how he views the universe in order to find comfort and meaning. A question that often chugs away in the background in existential debates is whether someone needs a genuine belief in something higher than themselves in order to have a robust reason to carry on. Some philosophers like Kierkegaard or Schopenhauer strongly suggest that we do, or at least most of us do. 
and in very different ways, they paint existentially affective philosophical views of reality in order to help people deal with the sufferings of life. On the other hand, someone like Nietzsche seemed highly sceptical of the idea that we needed our sense of meaning to be grounded in a view of the world itself, or something beyond the world. He was much more optimistic that if we just organised and strengthened our wills enough, we could create meaning out of that. Hence his idea that someone's ability to bear suffering is in direct proportion to the strength of their will. A similar thought, though very different in detail, is expressed by some French existentialists like Jean-Paul Sartre. Ab uh, I can, uh, uh, hmm. Rachel says, do you, do you feel guilt about telling them that you're going to hell? Um, honestly, I felt some shame because shame comes from the bubble, the expectation of behavior. Guilt comes from your own values. I felt shame and wor I was worried. Right. Because saying you're an atheist in that bubble was like basically saying you were like an evil person because like they think you need God. Not now, but they used to think you needed God to like tell you right or from wrong. Um, that was really common. And uh, I think I was mostly afraid to come out. I came out when I was 21. My partner and I just actually read the letter that I had sent to my parents, which they never opened. My brother had it. I'd given it to him. I was like, give this to mom and dad. And they never opened it because they already knew what it was. My mom already knew what it was. And she never told my dad about it. And my dad, in his defense, didn't know. But I have the letter. So I opened it for the first time, like 13, 14 years later. And I read the letter of me coming out to my parents. And it's fascinating. It's really interesting. But that was much more terrifying than coming out as an atheist. I will say, though, I didn't come out as an atheist right away. I came out as agnostic. And then as an atheist. And that was like... <gasps> You know, and then coming out as gay and it was like, you know, it was like oh, one thing after another. And then um, now I'm pansexual. So, you know, but it's like this. Ultimately, I learned that the fear I had was the fear of not being unconditionally loved, which my parents uh, ended up proving uh, time and time again that they unconditionally love me. And that even though we have these extreme differences, like I'm still their daughter. We talk almost every day. Um, I just talked to my mom again this morning. Like we send each other Marco Polos all the time. We're not like on the phone all the time, but we're like messaging and videotaping for each other. And so I think what my family proves to me time and time again is that regardless of our differences and our beliefs, we unconditionally love each other. We just love each other so much. And we understand that regardless of our differences, like the people, the consciousness that we are, that person could never be replaced. And so I am so grateful every day that I come from a family that unconditionally loves me, even when they vote against my civil rights. <laughs> Human's gonna human, you know. The flop says, what's your cat's name, Brittany? Her name is Indiana Jones. And look, she's right there, baby, in our, in our membership emojis. Indiana Jones, sweet girl. I love her. Okay. Absurdist thinkers like Albert Camus throw a completely different light on this question because they view the need for a meaning to life as resting upon a belief that the universe owes us that meaning. Totally, which I think goes back to, I think Hannah maybe had the question earlier, like what about the attachment in relation to the why? So you want to let go, in my opinion, my practice is I let go of the attachment to even my why, even though I center my foundation on the why. So this is this is a deep practice. This is not a practice I expect people to do, right? But what you what I do is I tell myself like this is my foundational why. This is who I am. And then when you start to practice like attachment, letting go of the attachment of even your why, you sort of have that realization of like do I even exist? But not in like a literal sense, but kind of like in a literal sense. And you start practicing sort of the macro and the micro understanding of the self. Like, who is the self? Like, what is even the self? You know, does the rock question itself? Does the tree question its existence? Does the bear have a relationship with self? Yes. But also, they just are. So when you're practicing sort of a meditation understanding of like, you just are, like, you are literally energy in the universe. You are a tree in the universe. It's just in the form of a human. There's like almost a questioning of like, what even is the self? You know, and then you kind of practice that, which kind of detaches from the why that you put into foundation in the first place to even know the self because the why is for the self but what if the self doesn't even exist and of course not in like a literal sense but also if you zoom out far enough I'm personally really torn on this question, and I suspect it might vary from person to person. 
and I would love to get your thoughts on it. Do you think we can have stable meaning that we necessarily view as maintained only by our own will? Or would the fact that we recognize our meaning as essentially subjective entail a certain fragility? Since we would be the only ones enforcing the meaning and it's notoriously difficult to exert our will when we are in extreme suffering, would it fall apart at the first sign of trouble? If you think this depends on individual temperament, what are the sorts of properties you think someone would need to have in order to will meaning into existence? And how can we learn to achieve these properties? Whatever your answers to these, I think Boethius's work contains a treasure trove of insights into the kinds of jobs a personal philosophy can do, the sorts of constraints we might want to place on its construction, and, perhaps most importantly, how through philosophy someone was able to suffer an agonizing, painful death with a calm and serene mind. And whoever we are, we can certainly learn a lot from one of the bravest thinkers of all time. But of course, you're going to find the question of meaning very difficult if you're an outright nihilist. So click here to check out my analysis of this terrifying philosophy. And st <laughs> stick around for more. Okay, stick around for more. I really like him. He's good. This is unsolicited advice. I'm going to like it. I'm already subscribed, of course, and I'll go ahead and share the link in the chat. Also, another person I recommend is obviously John Verveke, The Meaning Crisis. I'm... Always going back to Verveke and reviewing old episodes of The Meaning Crisis. I just think it's so helpful. Also, you hear different things when you watch something many times. You hear like different parts or you experience it differently. And, you know, all of this depends too where you are in your philosophy journey. Maybe you've never even read a book about philosophy or never even heard of a philosopher, never even thought about modern philosophy, for philosophy versus ancient philosophy versus religious philosophy versus metaphysical philosophy versus, you know, XYZ philosophy. The idea... And how I look at it is everything is a tool and I'm just putting tools in my little toolbox to use it for my own life. So if you're feeling overwhelmed, that's okay. You can go at your own pace. You know, like I say, there's no rush, but do it now. But there's no rush. Take your time. But like do it now, you know. All right, guys. I think that's it for me tonight. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I really enjoyed that video. I really think you guys should check out his channel. Stuff. My head in Miller Farm bed, my belly's being fed, and I'm okay. I'm just fine, yet all I do is whine. Not to you in my mind, cause I know I don't make sense. I've been nothing but blessed, so why's my life a mess? Please tell me, cause I'm sick of thinking. Yeah. I'm sick of reaching out for the truth And living life as a fool Dun, da, 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 da.